Oh, how gozaimasu. Good morning, everybody, and arigato gozaimasu to the scientific committee for asking us here to present this work. Uh, and now that I'm speaking about veterinary communication, I'm afraid I've exhausted my skoshi amount of knowledge of Japanese. As a child, I grew up in Okinawa, Japan, so it's very nice to be back in Japan, and thank you very much for the warm welcome. And I'll spend the next few minutes talking about some of the work from Dr. Alison Bard's PhD thesis, looking at veterinary communication fits in very well for what we've heard from the keynote speech and the last talk about um, veterinary herd health and how we as veterinarians can do a better job of communicating with our farmers, which is highlighted in both of those talks. So as we've heard already, and as many of you in this room know, there is a lot of information out there about veterinary herd health, addressing particularly the endemic diseases, lots of research. We know a lot about the risk factors, management strategies that make a difference in this area. And there's a lot of experience and skill in this room and around the world of people that are very good at doing this work. But how come we haven't made the sorts of changes? Why do we still have problems with these diseases? This was a question that we asked ourselves in this research. What are we missing? And one thing that's already been highlighted, sometimes we're missing a degree of this communication. There's work that's been done uh, by Yolanda Jansen and, and others to show that when veterinarians speak, we speak in a very directive style. We tell people what to do and how they should do it. That's kind of our role and the role that we embody. And that's the way that we've learned to speak. And that's the way that, that the role that we embody and how people expect us to speak in some ways as well. But the problem we have, particularly in some of these endemic multifactorial diseases, is that farmers are ambivalent. On the one hand, of course they want their cows to have good welfare. They want to improve lameness. They don't want to have so many lame cows on their farm. But on the other hand, they have too many other things to do. They're very busy trying to balance all the things that are going on. So they can't spend all that extra time foot trimming, looking at feet running foot baths and making cows better for lameness. So they want to do something, but there are other things that are holding them back. And this is the definition of ambivalent, ambivalence. And particularly when farmers are ambivalent, this directive style doesn't work very well. Anyone that has young children, as I do, knows about uh, trying to speak to them in a different way. When you tell them to do something, they specifically don't want to do that. And that's a very a psychological reactance. It's a very human response. When someone's told what to do, you automatically push back and you don't want to do that. So using this directive style of communication really doesn't result in very good engagement with that advice. In fact, farmers are more likely to push back against us, especially when they feel this ambivalence. So what we were looking for is a, a different methodology, a different way that we can communicate. And we happened on motivational interviewing which was created by Bill Miller and Steve Rolnick in the medical sciences, really for addictions counseling. So they noticed that some counselors were much better in getting people that were addicted to substances off of those substances than others. And it was about the way that they spoke with them about this. So this methodology is very person-centered, very goal-oriented, and really helps the client or the farmer, in our case, to examine their intrinsic motivation. Why do I get up in the morning? What things do I do that are very important? And it's very evidence-based, as we heard about in the last talk. So we were quite happy to be able to trial it. Although it was developed in the medical sciences, it's been applied in the environmental sciences, in things like homeland security and counterterrorism. So we thought maybe it can work for veterinarians as well. We're a bit of a special breed, but let's try. So the one, so a couple of terms that I'll use further on in the presentation is thinking about, on the one hand, I want to do something. When a farmer says that, that they will do something, that they want to try something, we talk about that as change talk. They're saying to themselves, and, and there's work to show saying those things out loud mean we're more likely to actually do it when we say it in a positive way. So we want to get them speaking in this change talk way rather than in this sustained talk I'm just going to do things the way they've always been done. I don't really want to change. I don't want to do things any differently. So that's what we're aiming for, getting them to do the change talk and not so much sustained talk. And when we look at motivational interviewing, it looks at two different ways that we communicate the relational communication. How do we establish partnership? How do we establish empathy? How do we accept where the farmer is? And we do that by things like reflective listening, speaking back to the farmer, the things that we've just heard them speak to us affirming them, asking them open questions so we can explore their motivations, 
emphasizing their own autonomy and seeking our collaboration with them. And the ways that we do this are technical ways in trying to get them to speak in this change talk way and not trying to get them to, to talk in this sustain talk way. So we, again, use our strategic listening. We use evocative questions. We summarize the things they're, they're saying and help give them, give them confidence that they can change, that they can do things differently. So that's what we're looking for when we're using motivational interviewing techniques. There were three main questions then we asked in this research. Can vets, in some brief training, can we learn? Can we do things differently? Can we learn how to communicate differently? And then does that change in communication change the way that the farmer talks? Do the farmers use more of this change talk in response to differing vet communication? And then what skills that the vet is using are most influential? Is it the reflections? Is it the open questions? Is it the positive affirmations? What are most influential of these skills on the farmer's language? And in order to do this, we enrolled some vets. So we had six veterinary practices that helped us with this and about 60 vets that came along to some brief training. We did this mostly in the evenings at a clinical club or a journal club. About two hours of an evening, there was one session, and then a couple weeks later, there was another session. And we, for the research, we asked vets before they came along to the training to record themselves speaking to a farmer on farm about anything, any change that they thought needed to be made for the benefit of herd health. And then after the training, we asked them to record another conversation so that we could analyze these two conversations. We had lots of vets turn up, but as vets go, sometimes they were late because of farm calls overrunning. Sometimes they had to leave early because there were calls coming in. And so in fact, and it's also, it's quite daunting. I don't know if you've ever recorded yourself or listened to yourself recorded, as I might do on the website after this talk. But it is a little, do I really sound like that? Oh no, did I say that um too many times? What was I talking about? So it is a bit daunting, and we only had 14 vets, in fact, that were able to come along to both trainings and submitted a pre-training uh, pre -training recording and also a post-training recording. But this was enough to give us some decent results anyhow. To give you an idea about what sorts of vets we enrolled in this, most of them were under 40. Most of them had 10, less than 10 years in, in practice. And in the UK, we have been doing communications training for the last 10 years in our veterinary schools. And that's increasing worldwide. So we're very excited to see that and to be a part of that as well. So that's the demographic of vets that we had enrolled. We did have 31 recordings that we analyzed all of them for these vets. And they were on a broad topic, broad, broad topics about herd health. So calf health, mastitis, reproduction, mineral deficiencies, etc. Some were quite short, only about five minutes. Some were quite long, over an hour, with an average about 23 minutes. And these are the things that Allison listened to, to, to hear how the vets were speaking and how the farmers were speaking in return. She then scored them using motivational interviewing treatment integrity code, or the MITI code. This is a quantitative way to score the utterances or the ways that the vets are speaking and the things that they're saying. It examines the verbal behaviors, how often are they reflecting, asking open questions, et cetera. And then it assigns them a relational and a technical score for how they're speaking. And she also scored how the farmers spoke with a client language and motivational interviewing code, or a CLAMI code. Again, this looks at the client's verbal behaviors and how much change talk they're using versus how much sustained talk versus how much neutral talk about the weather or the football or whatever else they might have been discussing that has nothing to do with the change they're looking to make on farm. She used the Noldus Observer software to listen to these and to code these, both the farmer language and the vet language. Then she did some analysis so that we could see, can vets learn new tricks? Can we do things differently? And yes, we can. So even after this brief training, vets were better able to use these reflections, reflect back to the farmer what they were saying. They used more reflections than questions, so their reflection to question ratio went up. Their relational score increased and their technical scores increased. Before the training, in the conversations that were recorded, no vets were considered competent in motivational interviewing. But after the brief training, some of them did achieve competence. And there was a decrease, on the other hand, in the inconsistent motivational interviewing behaviors. So things like trying to persuade, trying to confront, making a farmer feel bad about what they're doing, as was highlighted in the keynote. We want to decrease these. And vets with this training were able to decrease the way that they approach those things in these herd health conversations. 
When we looked at the farmers then, we also saw that there was a significant increase in farmer change talk. So farmers responded very well to the way that the vets were communicating and said more things like, I will, I shall, I can do things differently. And why is this? Well, we think it's probably because that relational connection was enhanced, there was more empathy, the farmer felt more involved, felt more able to bring up their own ideas and the things that they might like to do that before, in a very directive style, they might not have the ability to bring up to the vet. And there was that technical awareness, that change in language, that feeling of connection. So this suggests that the farmers were more positively engaged with the veterinarians when they spoke in this way and really uptook some of this advice, some of these ideas, and made them their own and said, I'm going to do something differently. I'm going to change, which is very encouraging. We looked also at the communication skills that are most influential. And to do this, we wanted to see what happens when the vet speaks, what happens right after the vet uses this motivational interviewing consistent language and so to do this, we use we used sequential analysis so we can look at what's following on directly. The other analysis was pooled information, but now we're looking at, all right, right after I speak, we call it a volley. When I speak and you speak back to me, what are you saying depending on what I just said? So there were almost 4,000 of these transitions in language, and Alison used conditional probability to look at these and found that when vets were using this motivational interviewing consistent behavior, there was more change talk coming back from the farmer. So that's exactly what we want to see, a way to get them to respond with the things that they will do on farm. And yet when the vets used inconsistent behavior, when they tried to persuade or they tried to confront, as we know from psychological reactants, the farmers kicked back and said, nope, we don't want to do that. We're not going to do that. They didn't use that same amount of change talk. So what we found in this work is that even brief training, and in the medical sciences we usually look for about three entire days of motivational interviewing training, but even in four hours or so, vets can uptake these skills, they can do a better job of communicating, and the farmers do respond to this as well. We don't know, we haven't followed these vets to see how long this lasts. We know from the medical sciences that continued coaching, just like anything in life, continued practice, makes you better at this, uh, at this skill, so that's probably needed for maintenance. And longer training may be needed for more complex skills, things like complex reflections, where instead of just mimicking back to you what you said, I'm actually interpreting and saying, you feel quite sad about those lame cows. That's a, a, a more complex skill that takes a bit more training. But there were some fantastic quotes, and this is one of our favorites that came out of this work, that one of the trainees emailed afterwards and said, you know, I've been using some of those techniques you taught me and I'm really surprised. I've had some very soft responses from some very hard farmers. So this is powerful stuff and we can make a difference and change the way that we communicate. I'd like to thank everybody who's been involved in this work. And if you would like to hear a bit more, I'm presenting tomorrow afternoon about the qualitative work and the qualitative analysis of some of Alison's PhD work as well. Arigato gozaimashita. Thank you.